without further ado, can we worship the Lord this morning? Amen. We worship the Lord with every fiber of our being and and not worry about what happened yesterday or the day before or the day of last week. And each and every day is a time and opportunity to worship. And I was talking to Chris this morning and he said the first thing he does when his feet his feet hit the floor is worship. God, what is it for you today that you want me to do? Because we all have plans, don't we? We all have things we want to accomplish, but sometimes our plans might not be what God wants us to do. So it's important that we stay open to that. So this morning as we come into a time of worship, I pray that you give it up for God. Amen. Because He deserves it. And let's 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 really concentrate on what worship is. Let's really concentrate on what we're doing. We're not doing it just to sing a bunch of songs. We're not doing it to see who's louder and who's not who's singing or whatever. We're doing it to give God the glory. Yeah. Yeah. So however that works for you, then I really pray that you let that shine. Amen? Yeah. Father God, we come before you this morning. We're so thankful that we can even come to a place and worship you. We know, Lord, even if we were in prison, we could still worship you. Yeah. I'm thinking of so many people. Matt and Diana was in prison, Lord, but she still worshiped you. She wrote the Bible on the walls of her cell. So I pray, God, that we can have that kind of fortitude in our own lives to worship you through every adversity that's been thrown at us. And we give you the praise and glory always in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the enemy is out to destroy. And the Bible says he seeks whom he can't destroy. How does he do that? He does that sometimes in areas in our life that we allow him to do it to. And then there's times in our lives when when the enemy attacks us for no reason except to destroy us. Amen? So when the enemy comes to bring us bewilderment and to bring us unbalanced life, we need to realize that greater is he in us than he was in the world. Amen? Amen. The The last thing that the enemy wants to hear, folks, is get away from me, devil. Get away from me, devil. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to walk the way you want me to walk. You get on your horse and leave. Amen. Amen. That's what he, he doesn't want to hear that. But what he wants to hear is, oh, 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 because he knows he's getting to you. Amen. What Pat's going through this morning is a spirit attack. Yes. What she's going through this morning is something the enemy's trying to bring upon her. The greater is he was in her than he was in the world. Folks, well, listen to me when I'm saying this. You're going to experience things in the last days that you're going to, you're going to be need to be prayed up, right up, and fed up because the enemy's going to try to destroy you and everybody around you. All your loved ones are in danger. Your husbands, your wives, your kids, your grandkids, they're all in danger. Even if they know Jesus, because the enemy will still try to stop them. But remember, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And sometimes you need to step out of your comfort zone and praise God and worship God in the middle of the storms. Whoa, Pastor, wait a minute. No, in the middle of the storms. I'll tell you what happens. When the enemy realizes that you're walking after the Spirit, whoa, I don't want none of that. Because he knows he's already defeated. He knows he has no power over you, but what you give him. That's true or not? But what you give him. And the enemy will always bring something into your nowhere or into your vision or your sight to get it into your knower. Because once it's in your knower, then you have to fight extra hard. Yeah. But if you have the, 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 the angel of the Lord, the Spirit of God, surround you with His peace and His joy, it can't come in. Everybody in this room is going through something. I deny it for you to tell me you're not. Everybody in this room is going through something. Why? It's because the enemy wants to destroy you. But again, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Amen? Turn with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. And 
Lord dropped this into my spirit. And I want to read it. Second Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to start with verse 14. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go to chapter 2 of Second Timothy. <clears throat> We'll start with verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of my witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What happens when you begin to start teaching others about what you know? about what the Holy Spirit has revealed to you, about what the Word has revealed to you, when you begin to show it, the enemy tries to stifle it. He tries to bring it to a close. That's why this is said right here. Make sure that you have heard me, what you hear in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier is active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlists in him as a soldier. Do not entangle yourselves with the things the enemy is trying to bring upon you. Because as he entangles you in them, then it causes you to draw away from the strength, from the anchor that we all know is Christ Jesus. Amen? Also, verse 5, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Are you all looking for a prize today? Are you looking for the song that we just got through singing, get rid of everything, just to have that crown on? Then we need to get rid of stuff, don't we? The hardworking former ought to be the first to receive his share of the crop. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to the imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not in prison. Woo! The word of God is not in prison. You can't lock it up. The only way it gets locked up is if you, if you don't push it out. If you refuse to spread the word of God, then it stays locked up in your in your person. Right? For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. Trustworthy statement, for if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also denies us. I don't know about you, but that's scary. You mean my Savior, my Lord, who got crucified by his own people, will deny me if I deny him? That right there, folks, ought to make us go, you know what, I ain't denying God another time ever. Right? Because the last thing we want is Jesus to say, Matthew 24, 25, I don't know you. I don't know you. Lord, but, no, I don't know you. Verse 14, remember them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and lead to the ruin of the hearer. Words don't get you nowhere. It's what's best behind the words that makes it powerful, that makes it strong in life. Because an empty word doesn't accomplish nothing, does it? An empty word doesn't accomplish nothing. And sometimes people, even believers, speak empty words because they don't believe what they're saying. Sometimes it's just what we're supposed to do, so I speak it. No, don't speak empty words. Look at the next verse. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, 
as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Accurately handling the word of truth. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of what Jesus has done for you. Don't deny Christ. Don't deny what he's done for you. Let the world know. If your world has three people, let them know. We're coming to a time in our walk or time in our, in our life when it's just about over. Do you believe me or not? Jesus is coming back, folks. Now, we can have an all kinds of prophetic this and prophetic that, time like this and time like that, but the bottom line is this. Not even Jesus knows. Only the Father himself knows. And when he said, let's go, there ain't nothing you can do about it. So should we be read up and prayed up and fed up every day that we wake up? So when the enemy comes to attack us, we know what to do with the attack. Just like Pat did. I need prayer. I need prayer. Sometimes we think, oh, I can handle this. No, you can't handle it. How many in this room have ever seen a demon, uh, a demon-possessed person get set free from a demon? I have a few times. But the only thing that does it is the Word of God. You can't say, I cast you out. No. It, well, who are you? I cast you out in Jesus' name, you foul spirit, you liar. And what's he have to do? He has to go. He has to go. He cannot stay. But sometimes we confront those situations in our own thinking, thinking, well, you know what, maybe this is going to happen, maybe it won't. Then don't try. Amen? Don't try. You've all heard the story. I've repeated myself a hundred times when Lisa and I were in Vegas preaching the word one time. And a spirit, demonic person came in the room. And I knew right then and there the Holy Spirit is, 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 is going to do something great. Amen? So we began to pray for this girl. And when she started, her throat started doing the bubble thing and stretching out and everything, and her neck went up, the people in the, in the church ran to the walls. <laughs> and I walked up to that girl and I said, in Jesus' name, you cannot stay there. You have to come out in Jesus' name. Well, she started doing the, it wasn't her, it was the spirit of Jesus, started doing the thing. And I said, go in Jesus' name. And I told my wife, go over the door. I didn't go over the door. I said, what is this? The door finally got opened. And what the, what the, what the reason was to open the door was simply, I don't know. It was simply for me to see the spirit that was in here leave that place. If God has a, if God didn't give me the opportunity to see that spirit leave, actually walk it, run across the floor, turn his head around, do it, and then walk out, I've seen it. It's real. But again, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. But you can't go after it haphazardly. Oh, I, I want to pray for you. Go in Jesus' name. It doesn't work. Because you have to know who you are in Christ. You have to know how to rightly divide the word of truth so you can be that power force that the Holy Spirit wants to use. Amen? Verse 16, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. Avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. What's he talking about here? He said, don't waste your time on talking about stuff that really doesn't matter, that's just empty clatter and, and just vocal talking because you want to hear yourself talk. It's not going to accomplish nothing. Sometimes, I, I don't know what it is, I heard I don't know how many years ago, a woman using so many so many words in a day, I don't know what that is, and a man using not even quite that much. <laughs> right? Because I think in our spirit we learn, don't say nothing. But at the same time, we need to know what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. And we don't know it if we're not in the Word. So I appreciate those that have told me, you know, first thing I do, Pastor, is I read the Word and ask God, what's today for? Absolutely. What's today for? 
Because you're, you're feeding your spirit. You're giving yourself power through the anointing of the word. If you didn't know the word, anything can come up to you and lead you astray. Anything can lead you astray. We have to know the word. Verse 17. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenus and Philitus, whatever. Many who have gone astray from the truth, saying the resurrection has already taken place, and they have set the faith of a stone. Can you imagine? If you didn't know the word, if you were in the word, and if you were prayed up, read up, and set up, anything can come down the pipe and cause you to walk the other way. Anything. Anything. Oh, I like the way them headlines read. I'm going to read them next thing. You know, boom, what? Oh, my gosh. If we know the word, and if we know who wrote the word, and if the word lives alive in us, nothing will throw us off the track. But what we let throw off the track. I got news for you, folks. God's already got it planned out. God already knows what the next step is. What we can do is quit figuring it out and do whatever he asks us to do for that step. Right? Sometimes we fail to realize that God's already got it in, in charge. God's already done it. And we as believers need to come together and learn the word and teach the word and pray the word and eat the word and consume the word. So we'll be ready to fight the fight that's going to come up on each and every one of us. Some of us are already going through stuff. You know the first thing that happens when you go through stuff? The first thing that happens when you start going through stuff is going, man, this, this ain't right, this ain't good, I'm, this, this, this is going to hurt. No, when you start going through stuff, you say, Lord, what am I going through this for? Is there a reason why I'm going through this? What's the purpose I'm going through this for? Because sometimes we begin to look at our own self, our own side, and we begin to go, oh man, there's something right here. God might be bringing you through something for such a purpose that you have no idea about right now. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we want God to reveal. He's not ready for the revelation. <laughs> right? That's why God calls, and I don't, there's no calling more important than any other time. You being right here in this building today, worshiping God and hearing me talk, is no more powerful, no more less of a calling than me standing up behind this platform. Amen. No different. When God has called you to do something, jump in with both feet and do it. And let him show you and prove you. The only way that happens is if you're in the Word. Amen? The Word is what brings us to the place in our life and we can be set free from all the infirmities that have been, the devil has lost upon us. Now, perhaps you speak too much about the enemy. Someone's got to. Because he's real. What's Ephesians tell us? Our warfare is what? Not against, but against. What does that tell you? Principalities of the air. So what does that tell you? The enemy's out there seeking someone to devour. And the way he does that is we drop our guard and begin to walk in our emotions. When we begin to walk in our emotions, the enemy can grab a hold of those and start walking you with your own emotions. Amen? Emotions do nothing. Emotions are part of yourself. Especially the ones that lead you astray. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. you believe that? We all have. Nobody in here hasn't. But at the same time, we need to tell ourselves, when we come up against a battle, I'm going to use the Word. I'm going to use what Jesus said to do. I'm going to do what the Bible says to do. I'm going to do what Paul wrote. Paul didn't go through what he went through for nothing. Just read half the New Testament. Paul went through stuff. Paul did stuff for such a time as Paul's life. Amen? Some of us in this room are going through stuff that we said, I wish this would never, I wish this would end, I'm tired of this. Let God do what God wants to do. Amen? And let me give you another bit of encouragement. 
When someone enters your life that's not walking in the right spirit, the spirit that dwells in you will not let it affect you. The spirit that walks in you, that lives in you, will not let that foul spirit affect you. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And let me tell you something, folks. That spirit, that demonic force, knows the spirit of God lives in you. <laughs> and he knows, I can't touch that. I was reading, a, a, watching a little thing the other day about a, a missionary. Or not really a missionary, but a guy used to go to all these different places. And he said, well, I get to be a missionary in the United States. And he prayed, and, you know, pray God over him and pray the spirit over him and this and that. And uh, mounds and you know all kinds of other places where he thought God would take him to. Well, he went to one place and he got done praying. He walked away and he got punched in the stomach so hard that he thought he was going to die in the middle of the snow. So he laid down and his leg curled up on his on his knees came to his shoulders and he couldn't untie himself. He was just stuck there. And he's asking God, God. Why don't you why don't you relieve me from this? Why don't you take this away from me? You know what God spoke to him? Spoke to him that I didn't call you to go there. You left yourself open by walking out of my will to go there. So God says don't, don't. If God says go, go. What happened was when the individual realized, you know what, Lord, you're right. I wasn't. You didn't call me to go here. I just thought this is what I'm supposed to do. Thought. See there? The guy straightened him out. He got in his van, turned the heater on, got inside his coat, warmed himself off, and took off. And from that time on, he said, God, if I'm to pray here, you let me know. If I'm not, I'm passing it by. And how many of you know, in our little community here, all over, there's places that need to be re revealed, need to be set free from demonic forces. But don't go until God says go. Amen. Sometimes we get ourselves in trouble because we think we're cool. We think we're all that. we got the spirit there, so guess what? No, it doesn't work that way. God has to go before you to prepare the way for you. Sometimes we get in a hurry because we want to see people even look at my spirituality. No, it's not your spirituality that matters. It's Christ in you that matters. <clears throat> now get on my head. You know, there's, there's judgment coming. And if you don't know the word, you don't know what the judgments are. Right? If you don't know the word, if you're not read up and prayed up and, and fed up, and just like what the verse of Timothy says here, if you're not accurately dividing the word of truth, if you're not letting the word of truth penetrate and bring you that wisdom and truth, then anything can come across the pipe and cause you to walk in fear. <clears throat> to hear things like judgment, to hear things like, like this could happen, this could happen, what really matters is your walk with him. That's all that matters. That the only thing that brings you the peace is, is for him. And sometimes people say, you know, when is this all going to happen? When's this going to take place? When's all this stuff supposed to take place? John 5, 22 tells us, not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. We sometimes judge out of character. Jesus says, don't judge. But as you judge, I'm going to judge you. There's five different judges spoken in the, in the judgment spoken in the Word. Five different ones. There's the first judgment is the sins of the believer have already been judged in Christ on the cross. How many of you believe that? The first judgment, your first judgment has already been taken care of on the cross. So who are we to judge anybody else and try to help them to understand that they need to do this and they need to do that when the reality is they need Jesus. Sometimes our, our own emotions get in the way of presenting Christ to other people. <clears throat> Sometimes we want people to suffer. Sometimes we want people to go through stuff to make them, to make them understand what Christ does for them. 
that, that they'll go through what they need to go through until, until Christ can bring them to him. Amen? But like the Bible says, if they're not told, how are they going to know? So some of the judgments that, that we go through in our lifetime, the first, first, the first and more important judgment is that we've been already been judged. Our sin has been judged on the cross. When we accept Christ, we've already been judged. The cross is already our, our station. And sometimes when we hear about other people, maybe maybe this person don't know Jesus the way they say they do. Let, let the cross handle it. Let Jesus handle it. Sometimes we get <clears throat> God's judgment mixed around with what we're supposed to do with it. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with helping somebody. Okay, you're in the wrong place. I need to I see you're walking down this way. I see you're 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 you know you need some help with it. That's different. But when you start pointing fingers, <clears throat> then we need to first realize that we've already been bought and paid for. Our Lord Jesus Christ hung on the cross for you and I. We've been paid for. That judgment is done. No more. And there's also people out there, and we all know a few of them, that have claimed to know Jesus, but their fruits don't show it. They will come underneath their own judgment one day. Amen? And folks, I, I'm here to tell you that if the Spirit dwells in you, like I believe it does everyone in here, you'll be able to tell the person that's talking to you isn't right. You'll be able to know. You'll be able to see things that you don't normally witness. The second judgment, and I won't get into all these, the believer is to judge self. The believer is to judge self or be judged by the Lord Jesus as discipline. What do you mean, judge self? My judgment has already been taken care of. John 5, 24 says, that says that the believer does not come into judgment because of what's already happened on the cross. We do not come into judgment as long as we are walking in the, in the Spirit. Amen? And we recognize Jesus as our Lord. Our sins were judged in Christ on Calvary. Our sins were judged in Christ on Calvary. Who are we to judge everybody else's sins? Who are we to point fingers? Well, you know what? You're, you're walking in sin. Let me help you. Different story. Let me bring you to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let me help you abandon this. But the first thing we start doing a lot of times is begin to judge. It's all over the news. As soon as we hear the pastor going the wrong way, oh man, that guy, he must not have been right. How do you know what's going on? Now granted, sometimes they take a, a, a drastic step and abandon your faith. But you have to ask yourself, how much have you let Christ take care of your sins? Did you give him a little bit or did you give him all of them? Because he died and, and perished and suffered for the sins of humanity from beginning to end. The third judgment, all believers must appear at the judgment seat of Christ where their works are to be judged. Well, I mean, I've got to stand before Jesus one day and have him judge my works, how I did them, what I did with them. Think, of, you know, think about that for a minute, folks. Stand before the throne room. Stand before Jesus. And have him judge what you did while you were in him. Don't get me wrong. The judgment at that point isn't to send you to hell. The judgment at that point is okay. You you should have done this. I love you. I died for you. Your sins are forgiven. But your works need to be this and this and this. Faith's not working for you. dead. I didn't know that. The third judgment, all the fourth judgment, all nations are to be judged at the second coming of Christ. All nations. I know sometimes we hear the word judgment and we get all oh man. Well, so, is that really going to happen? Yeah, it's going to happen. I, I, 
I hate to tell you this, folks, but some of you probably know this, but knowing Jesus isn't always peaches and cream. It isn't always a, a, a brick gold driveway. It isn't always having the best of this and the best of that. Otherwise, Jesus doesn't love me. Yeah, Jesus loves you. He proved it on Calvary. Well, how come I don't have this? Are you praying? Are you seeking? Are you letting God do something in your life that you need to let him do in your life? Or are you fighting against it? Understand this, folks. If you don't get nothing out of the service today, understand this. Your sin judgment has already happened on the cross. Jesus ascended to the Father and spread out his blood on the mercy seat. It's done. I've accomplished it. I paid the ultimate price. Some of us in this room aren't ready to pay that price. And I don't mean necessarily die for Jesus. I mean walk for Jesus. Some of us in this room, we want to we want to be in control of something without walking it out. Some of us in this room, I'm not saying, you know, literally, but there's people out there that expect more without doing the work. You can't leave your Bible on your nightstand and expect the work to work through you, can you? You can't, you can't expect to have all this, this ability to cast out demons and raise the dead and heal the sick if you don't know how it works. I'm so glad that when Jesus left the earth, he gave instructions. And he used Paul to show them instructions as well as all the rest of them that wrote. He used them to give us instructions. When he's gone, that wasn't the end of it. I'm going to send you a comfort. I'm going to send you the power. I'm going to send you the ability by the Holy Spirit to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Who in the world in the right mind would want to go to a graveyard and start casting out demons? But there's people out there that do. There's people out there that go to services, okay, what, how can I beat the devil up today? <clears throat> the fifth judgment, the wicked dead are to be judged at the great white throne judgment. Now we'll get into these at the Lord's will in the next few weeks or so. John 5, 24, in this verse, our Lord tells us that the believer does not come into judgment. Our sins were judged in Christ on Calvary, and every believer has passed out of death into life. Every believer has passed out of death into life. What is the promise to those that don't know Jesus, to those that don't walk in salvation, to those that don't put on the blood of Jesus? What's the promise? You will die for your sin, and you'll stay dead. Not the place that you want to go to which is very real, by the way. It's not just a blood scare anybody. It's real. We don't want to be there. This, this is our present salvation. We have passed from death into life. Our accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior has passed us from a uh, uh, an, an Adamic curse to die and put us into a, a revelation of peace not to live forever with him. You know, sometimes it's hard to us with that. Okay, I'm 60. I don't know, 66. It's hard for me to think, okay, live forever. God, you're going to have to change a lot in my brain. <laughs> You're going to have to change a lot in my heart because I can't fathom living forever. Right? You've got people like Noah, 900 years old before he even started building the ark. Can you imagine? 163 years old before you even had your first kid. Wait a minute. Can you can you fathom that? It's hard to it's hard to understand. It's hard to understand what God has for us. 
It is. As far as you understand, you folks, you in this room right now, can be pain-free, can be sickness-free, can be free from every demonic influence in your life. But what do you have to do? You have to call it out, believe it, and walk in. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to go through hurts and pains because that's the organic fallen nature of every one of us, is it? But that doesn't mean you have to control your life. Amen? There's, there's, there's emphasis of people in here that have different, different things in their mind that, that control the law of your life. Which is, there's nothing you can do about that unless God chooses to say, okay, that's all. But if we fail to walk in the peace of the path of any understanding when we're going through stuff, we'll never get set free from stuff. It's pretty hard to fathom just walking down the street without knowing the Word, without knowing Jesus. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk by this tree and just be healed. <laughs> How would you even know about healing if someone was told you about it? <clears throat> Let me tell you something, folks, there ain't nobody out there. I'm not really hear what they say. There's nobody out there that has not heard something about God and about Jesus somehow, somewhere. Christ paid for our sins. He was judged in the believer's place. I don't know about you, but when someone pays for something for you, it's like, whoa, that was awesome. The believer will not come into judgment because Jesus paid for it. The believer will not come into judgment because Jesus already paid for that. Have you ever tried to, I'm not going to say that because I've done this myself. Have you ever ate at a restaurant and scoot out the front door or back door without paying? Am I the only one that's ever done that? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Oh, I was probably yeah. 15, 15, Diamond Dad. Yeah, Diamond Dad. Yeah. <clears throat> now, has anybody in this room ever done that but me? No, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Right? Yeah. And the thing is, too, folks, I did it at my mom's restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not her restaurant, but where she was working at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ paid the penalty on the grounds of his. Can you understand this for a minute? On his substitutional death. His substitutional death. He was a substitute for what we should have been going through. I don't know about you, but sometimes it takes a special revelation to know that there is Jesus. God incarnate, left his energy, and died for me in a horrible, terrific death for me. And his own people put him on the cross. Joe being a biker, he knows what it's like when you have someone in your group trying to get you, for whatever reason. Can you imagine even thinking about and I think this has to be revelation. Does that make any sense? It has to be revelation that Jesus paid the price for you. He took it on himself as a substitute for our sin, which deserves death. He took it upon himself so we could have life. We would never know that if we didn't put the word into our spirit. Amen? The believer is separated. The believer is separated from his sins forever. Psalms 103 12 says this As far as the east from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from sin. Now we can be analytical and say, okay, the east from the west, that's just around the world. That's not really that much. Think about it in a spiritual sense. He's removed it from you and chooses not to remember it. The sins of the believer have been wiped out and God has promised that he will not remember your sins no more. Isaiah 43, 12. He will not remember them The God of all knowing, the creator of the heavens and the earth, tells us 
I don't remember your sin. You almost have to sit back and go, and you call yourself God? <laughs> and you don't remember my sin? Understand this, folks. God can forget anything he wants to forget. And the price has already been paid. He needed a perfect sacrifice, a substitutional sacrifice, and that was his son that came and died for you and I. Our Lord suffered for our sins. Not only for the just, but also for the unjust. For the righteous as well as the unrighteous. Understand this for a second. Scripture says we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Right? He sees everyone as righteous. If we look through the eyes of ourselves, we can start pointing unrighteous things out every minute. But God sees you as the righteousness of himself in Christ. We are righteous before God because of the substitutional sacrifice of Jesus. Who are we to take that life? Who are we to hold that in? Who are we not to proclaim liberty to the lost? When we understand that he died for the unjust and the just, for the righteous and the unrighteous, that should buffet our pillow a little bit. Sometimes, just for the moment, sometimes I get accused of not being the harsh enough. <clears throat> well, if I was to be the harsh person I was before Jesus met me, because remember this, folks, people in here don't look for him. He looks for you. Right? When you was in your sin life, were you looking for Jesus? No. When you were robbing candy stores, were you looking for Jesus? I wasn't as I stuffed them things into my pocket. I was 10 and I'm still over there. <laughs> used to walk down. And I, I'm only revealing this stuff, Lord, to people to let you know that God forgives everything, even Mike and Ike's in your pocket. And some of us haven't done anything that bad, we think. The problem is, you're still a sinner saved by grace. That, that's the bottom line, no matter how bad of a sinner you were, because God does not look on one sin greater than the other. The only sin he looks on with with steamy little eyes is when you begin to deny Jesus and begin to deny the Spirit. When you begin to deny, and it's out there every day, folks, people are denying God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost left and right. I heard the other day there was a conversation between a, a, a Christian and a, a lost guy. And the lost guy was trying to convince the Christian that we all came from rocks, we all came from mud, we all came from trees. Everything, everything developed into who we are today. And the guy says, "Why don't you worship the rock then?" Well, that's kind of ridiculous. Well, you're saying you came out of the rock. That's that's your creator, that rock. Worship him. And the guy says, "Why well, don't make any sense?" And the guy says, "Let me show you. Let me tell you who we need to be worshiping." And that's your creator, the heavens and the earth, that put dirt in the ground, brought you out. Breathe life into you, and that's who you are today because of that. Not some rock. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the rocks will praise my name. <laughs> right? If you choose not to, the rocks will praise my name. Because, folks, even though we, we know rocks don't think, unless you're throwing them out the window, we think all you That did that on its own. No, it didn't. <laughs> Sometimes we fail to realize that if the rocks are going to praise his name and they're brainless and just a, a piece of whatever, who are we not to? When he breathes his very breath of life into us, who are we not to? It's time for God's people, forgive me my favorites, to quit whining and crying about what you don't have and walk in what you do. 
and that's forgiveness. That's righteousness. That's being called my son, my daughter, in front of the throne room of God. That's who we are because of power. I don't know about you folks, but every time I sit in my prayer closet or my prayer seat or whatever I'm doing, and I think, Jesus, why? Why did you come and go through all that? It's one thing if you came and hooked you up, done. That's okay. But you came and went through absolute misery. For what reason? For me. For me. You went through all that you went through, all the teachings, all the things, all the all the the, 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 the hardship that you had for me. And when Jesus said, you come follow me, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to sleep. Don't worry about it. You just come follow me and I will do what you need. Can we understand that? It's like, boom. You know why it's hard for some of us to grasp that? Because it hasn't been revealed to us yet by the Holy Spirit of what exactly was taking place. For you and for us. When the Holy Spirit reveals that, your prayer time becomes, Oh Lord, bless you. I worship you. I give you all glory, all power. I give you I, your worship time to be an hour doing nothing but worship and praising him. Because you promised me something and that is life and so. But sometimes we go say, I'll praise God for about two minutes, then I'll start asking for it. God don't obey us. Not eat the enemy food, but he has promised by all your needs. Walk in that promise. Amen? Our Lord suffered for our sins, the just and the unjust, that we might be saved and never come into a judgment as sinners. Never come into judgment as sinners. First Peter 3 18 says this For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just and the unjust. <coughs> So that we might bring us, so he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Our flesh is dead. If we choose for it to die, our flesh is dead, and our spirit man should be coming alive. As our spirit man outgrows our flesh man, we draw closer and closer and closer to our Redeemer. But so many times we let the flesh dictate what we do and what we don't do. Let God dictate it. Lord, I got this big job to do. What say you? Well, I want you to stay on the pray. Done. Lord, I got this, I got this thing I gotta do to you. What do you want me to do? I want you to go over here. Okay, done. But nine times ten, but God, but I need, no, you do what I ask you to do. But I need this, I'll supply your need. i got to be at this, I'll supply it, you just do what I ask you to do. Sometimes we fail to realize that God's in charge. He's in charge of your life. Your sins have been forgiven. You are standing in front of God, set free from death. You will... Never have to worry about, unless you walk away from the Lord, then that's a whole different story, right? But you will never have to worry about someone passing God a note and saying, hey, this person did this. It's his son, take care of it. How are you doing? How are you doing? There's no more that we have to do. There's no more that Jesus has to do. It's complete. Isn't that what the scripture says? It is finished. But sometimes we want him to do more. It's already done. It's up to us to do more. It's up to us to walk by faith and not by sight. It's up to us to walk at what we know in our knower and not what we hear in our hearer. <clears throat> but I got news for you folks. The devil can speak into your ear. He can convince you of stuff that you have no business being convinced of. You remember when you used to? Yeah, that's 
Remember when you do this stuff, get away from me, man. You know, I've been taking forever. Get away from me. <laughs> I can almost see him. No, we, 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 we can joke about the enemy because greater is he who is in us. Understand that for a second. Just think about it. Part of that this week. Jesus who lives in you by the power of the Spirit of the living God is greater in you than anything else in the entire universe. Anything. No demonic spirit, no voice of the enemy, no, no ravage from you. Nothing is bigger in you than him in you. Nothing but what you let in. What you let in can compromise what you let out. <clears throat> the, never, the believer will never be condemned with the world because Christ was condemned in his place. Condemnation is something running rapid in the world today. Is it or is it not? Condemnation is different than restoration. Do you believe that? So-and-so just said this to me. He's condemned. Well, that's the wrong, that's the wrong voice. That's the wrong attitude. But so-and-so said this, wants to pray for me because you know, that's different. That's restoration. Is that right or not? Condemnation brings death. Condemnation brings woe is me. I'll never be right. We've been set free from condemnation because of what Jesus did in our place. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 10. God making an appeal 
through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Why do you think Paul used the word might? You have a choice. It didn't say you don't have a choice, you can't or you will be. No, you might be if you choose that walk. Some people you share the gospel with won't choose it. Some people that you're trying to teach or, or bring reconciliation to won't hear about it. Won't have nothing to do with it. It's a choice. Aren't you glad that God has given us a choice? Amen. Otherwise, we'd all be a bunch of little robots. And that's what the world wants. They want you to be a robot. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ was made a curse for you and I. Christ was made a curse for you and I. God couldn't even look upon sin, couldn't even look upon mankind until a perfect sacrifice was made on the altar. That perfect sacrifice is Christ Jesus our Lord. Perfect, sinless, pure sacrifice for you and I. That's what he did for us. He was made a curse for us on the cross and on behalf redeemed us from the curse of the law. How many of you know if you read the Old Testament law, that's a pretty hard thing to follow. Isn't it? Like, really? It's impossible. If you look at the Ten Commandments, which is the law that we Jesus is talking about, right? If you look at the Ten Commandments, you say, man, how can I follow all these? You can't without him. And the other ones, let's just the bigger attack. There's no way you can follow all them. What are there, like six hundred of them or something? How can you how can, oh I can't eat I can't eat tomatoes on Tuesday. <laughs> And forget eating beef on Friday. That just don't work. My wife told me to stop that. Galatians three thirteen says this: He has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. He put away sin by sacrificing of Himself. How many of you in this room have ever sacrificed yourself for something or somebody else or something? Hebrews 9, 26, the believer will not come into judgment because of the sins have been purified. Hebrews 1, 3, our sins are purified because of what he did. But we will not know that if we don't have the right understanding of the word. Right? Let's go to the Enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the key of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, 
So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. I don't know about you, but that's the school. Sacrifice himself. <laughs> and some people can't even sacrifice a little bit for someone else. And we don't do that stuff for kudos. We don't do that stuff for animals. We do it because we're called by God to be an influence on the world that is God. Amen. And the ruler of this world, the God of this age, is ramped up because he knows this time is short. So the more people you can convince that God ain't real, that Jesus never existed and forget the Holy Spirit. If he can convince more people that day by day, which he's doing, and he's trying to accomplish his last second detail because he knows his time is up, we need to be as strong as ever, especially as the time draws close to him coming. We need to be strong because our desire should be just like his desire to bring all men into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The Savior, the Redeemer, who sacrificed himself once for us. We need to recognize that in our life. If God did it for you, he can do it for you. I have to say that with both hands raised. God can bring me to salvation. There ain't nobody going to touch me. Right? And then when the love of God begins to take over in your life, even people who you know go, man, what happened to you? I want some of that. I want to get rid of my hatred. I want to get rid of my rebellion. I want to get rid of my, my anti-Christ attitude. What, what did you do? I met my Savior. I met my Lord. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been set free from sin and condemnation. I am walking in restoration. I am walking in righteousness. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lord. Isn't that who we are? So let's not hold the redemption value back in here. Let's let people have it, both of them. And if they walk away from it, but mark my words, if God says say, you say, and it will happen. If God says do, you do, and it will happen. Even if you don't see the outcome of your doing, it will happen. It has to. The Bible says that the word of God cannot come back void. So if you know the word and you're given the word, it's going to accomplish what it's sent out to do. Amen? Father, thank you. Thank you for your word today. Thank you that your word brings us life. Thank you that your word gives us hope. But more than anything, your word reveals you to us. So, Lord, be with us, walk with us, talk with us, and fill with your ways, because your ways are perfect. Our ways, not so much. In Jesus' name, amen.